Hello everyone, welcome back. Well, I finally managed to plant all my annuals and flower pots and hanging baskets. So I'm feeling quite summery and flowery. I hope you enjoy in the summer as well. On this episode, let's talk about bird nests. Kevin Tewitt, who lives here in Northern Quebec, left for the winter only to come back to this on his entrance door. And there were three eggs there as well. So here's one situation. And then on our property, an American robin built a nest in our cedar hedge, which is very close to our garden and our entrance door. We could really see her sit on the nest. We really enjoy watching it. Then we left for a long weekend only to come back to the nest being completely disturbed with nothing on it and mama robin nowhere to be found. So here are two scenarios and what are you supposed to do? Well, according to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, no person may take, kill, possess, import, export, transport, sell, purchase, barter, or offer for sale any migratory bird or the parts, nests, or eggs of such bird, except as may be permitted under the terms of a valid permit. In Kevin's situation, because there were already eggs in the nest, he couldn't remove the nest, so he closed off access to his entrance door, and he's just waiting for the young chicks to leave the nest and the robin to be done with that brood, then he can remove it. In my situation, because the nest was abandoned and no one was using it, I can actually take it down, but I prefer to wait until the nesting season is over completely. I wait until fall to do all my cleanup. If you have a bluebirds or any other birds that have multiple broods per season, you can actually wait until they're finished with the first brood, then you can take the old nest and clean the birdhouse between the broods. And then if you absolutely have to cut down trees on your property, please inspect the tree and anything around that tree to make sure that there are no active nests there. If you don't really have to, if it's not dangerous to you, please wait until the nesting season is finished to cut it down. One day, Pamela, who lives in Missouri, decided to use the Merlin Sound ID app and it told her that she had a red whiskered bulbul in her area, which she found rather confusing since these birds only live in Asia. She's wondering whether Merlin could have made a mistake. Hi, Pamela. Isn't that Merlin app created by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology loads of fun? Not to mention exceedingly useful to birders and even scientists. But you were questioning whether that app ever makes a mistake mainly because it identified a red-whiskered bulbul calling in your neighborhood in Springfield, Missouri. A fair question, too. However, I'm actually going to support the Merlin app's identification. Red-whiskered bulbuls, medium-sized brown and white songbirds featuring a striking black crest, are supposed to be an Asian bird. However, they are widely kept as a singing cage bird and one of the favorite species used in bird singing competitions involving huge monetary prizes in Southeast Asia. Sadly, this means that they are trapped in the wild in numbers detrimental to their survival. But their beautiful singing abilities have not escaped North American ears, and thus they are somewhat popular as cage birds in the U.S. too. Like all cage birds, some do end up escaping into the great outdoors. If the winters are mild enough, they not only survive, but now nest in the wild. There are actually small breeding populations in California and Florida. Your observation of one detected in Missouri could mean that they're expanding the range or just a locally escaped bird. On the other hand, your app could have picked up the sound of a red-whiskered bulbul being mimicked by one of those rascally northern mockingbirds. Whenever you spend any time at a beach or a picnic place where there are lots of gulls of various species hanging about, know that they are eyeballing you very carefully, or at least some of them. They want to know what you're eating. You see, gulls do have this nasty habit of pilfering food from humans, sometimes ripping it right out of our hands. I recall folks from my years in Montreal jokingly referring to them as French fry hawks due to their unpleasantly aggressive, not to mention dangerous, habit of stealing fries right out of the hands of children. But not all gulls engage in this behavior, though. A recent study with gulls by scientists from the University of Sussex in the UK show that only about a fifth of the birds took interest in eating human foods. And the vast majority of them were adult birds. But the study also demonstrated something even more interesting. The ones that go after human food actually seem to seek our endorsement of what they should eat. 
The researchers placed two Walker's brand potato chip packets of different colors on the ground a few meters in front of single or small groups of herring gulls on Brighton Beach. They then sat in the sand and held a third chip packet that matched the color of either one of the packets on the ground. Nearly all, or at least 95% of the gulls, pecked at the chip packet that color matched the one they were holding. This suggests that the gulls possess the ability to identify and compare objects within their surroundings. In short, they were looking around to see what the humans in their immediate vicinity were eating to help them decide what they should eat. This means that the gulls are a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. And while that might be good for the gulls, it might not be so good for us. Another reason why we grow so many fruits and berries on our property is actually to attract cedar waxwings. They love wild blueberries and can clear out a bush in no time. Once a flock of cedar waxwings descends upon a bush or a tree with sugary fruits, they don't seem to be bothered by anyone or anything. Remember last year, I filmed a flock of cedar waxwings in the parking lot of our grocery store. There were cars driving by, people walking by. I stood within an arm's length of them. I filmed them with my cell phone and they didn't budge. The most difficult thing about identifying cedar waxwings is knowing how to distinguish them from bohemian waxwings. There are two things to look out for. First, their bellies. Cedar waxwings bellies are yellowish and bohemian waxwings bellies are gray. And another area is under their tails. Bohemian waxwings is kind of orangish uh, cinnamon and cedar waxwings is white. Their whistle-like calls are rather distinct. We always know when they're in our backyard and we've actually spotted, heard them on our hikes in the winter. Basically, where there are sugary fruits, there are cedar waxwings. They love junipers. So if you want to attract them to your backyard, plant a couple of junipers that are native to your area. Cedar waxwings are very social birds. They stay monogamous during their breeding season, but they don't start building their nests until June and somehow they manage to have two broods per season. If you do decide to plant fruit bearing trees and bushes, please remember that a lot of cedar waxwings die from window strikes, especially after they've consumed fermented berries in the fall or winter. So when you are looking for that perfect location to plant those trees, keep them away from your windows. Happy 4th of July to our American viewers and happy Canada Day to my fellow Canadians. I hope you had fun celebrating Canada Day. Our July photo contest, red, white or blue, was actually dedicated to these two very important uh, celebrations. So let's check out the top five. Here's the third place, the second place, and the grand prize winner. Congratulations, everybody. August has two photo contests, and the first one is Double Trouble. All right, everyone, that's it. That's all for now. Take care. I'll catch you in two weeks.